Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Leadership Purpose with Dr. Robin podcast. I'm so glad you're here and you take time to listen into the podcast. And because you've been listening in, you helped us become ranked in the top 5% of all podcasts globally, according to Listen Notes. So thank you for listening in. Really appreciate you. And we're starting on YouTube recently. And so if you'd go over there and subscribe to the channel, that would help us. But wherever you're listening, review, rate, subscribe, and that would be a big help so we can continue the podcast going and growing. All right. Okay. And today I'm talking with Jaina Sheets. And Jaina Sheets is a scientist, entrepreneur, and author of the fascinating Hannah's Ascent book. Welcome, Jane Sheets. Thank you, Robin. Uh, and it's so it's wonderful to be here. And I really, really appreciate the uh, your invitation and the opportunity to talk here. All right. I'm so glad you're here, Jaina. And, you know, I've been going back and forth with earlier we were talking, I would say Jane and Jaina. So uh, excuse me if I missed and didn't say oh, Jaina yeah. each time. Jane, yeah. <laughs> I'll try to get it right now. OK. All right. So uh, tell us about a little bit first about you and then about the work you do. Okay, great. So my work is, is I would say, it's a very uh, unusual mix of technology and art that you don't see uh, very often uh, because of the mentioned, as you mentioned, I've been both a scientist and um, and a creative writer. Um, but that kind of reflects how I've always felt. So if I just uh, thought I'd start from the very beginning, a very good place to start. So I've heard. Uh, I grew up in the mountains of Colorado, where our nearest neighbors were an elderly couple who lived three miles away. After 22 miles, the winding dirt road, often impassable in the winter, came an actual town of 500 people. Mail came twice a week, and electricity came when I was 10. Um, from there, I somehow wandered into Stanford University and a PhD in physical chemistry, and I did research at Hewlett Packard Labs for 20 years. Toward the end of that time, I got involved in the corporate product stewardship program, which sounded like a good thing. I didn't know much about it, uh, but I thought it would be great if I could support environmental causes uh, through the work that I was doing. And that led, um, after a number of steps, to the creation of something we called World E-Inclusion, which was a project to bring internet-based services to poor people, but on a for-profit, uh, not philanthropical uh, basis and also not exploitative, uh, a win for both sides. And uh, in that project, I met Dr. Mohamed Yunus of the Green Bank and worked with an ex-president of Costa Rica, uh, whose sister is probably even more famous. She was the environmental uh, negotiator for the United Nations for many years. Uh, but corporate political antibodies eventually got the better of that project, and I decided that it was time to leave. Uh, and play the startup game for a while where I co-founded some companies uh, in microelectronics. And the last one of those is still alive and well. And uh, and I'm still working on it as the CTO. Uh, so uh, uh, so that's the, the science part. But six and a half years ago, I started writing a novel, which was published last June. It's called Honest Ascent. And I can't wait to start the next one. I've, I've already, you know, sketched out lots and so on, but I haven't actually re written yet. Uh, I'm also writing a book on transgender women in athletics, which I've titled Genes, Gonads, and Synopses. And uh, it will uh, it cover every aspect from muscle physiology to the sociology of transgender girls since I, in high school or, or grade school. So I've never been exclusively a member of either side of the numerical verbal divide. Uh, and that's often uncomfortable because, or frustrating because it seems no matter who I'm with, uh, they're not going to understand an important part of me. On the other hand, it's uh, it's very, uh, it's a source of great insight and inspiration. Yeah, yeah. You, you've had a, a full, long, winding road there that you yes. covered quite well in just a short amount of time. I'm guessing you've had opportunity to share this story many times because it was so smooth the way you just flowed throughout the, the years and brought us right up to today. Thank you. It All right. All right. So now I want to ask you a different kind of, um, I use like on two sides. Okay. So you have your scientist side of you 
and the entrepreneur side of you and the author. It seems there's a creative side, left brain and right brain thing going on. How how have you uh, seen seemingly so smoothly navigated those different interests, passions, and abilities? You know, for, for for me, it's it's not really that much of a of, of a div of, of a division, and and I guess it's uh, it, it's something where I don't appreciate how it is for other people. I was um, so so I mentioned you know briefly this this background, and uh, until I was fourteen, uh, I had no. Uh, friends my own age. I mean, I had, I knew, there was nobody around but my family, basically, because, uh, you know, so it wasn't like I was an outcast at school. There just wasn't any school. So um, uh, so basically, I kind of grew up with, uh, with no preconceptions of the sort that I've only learned over the years that other people get from their peers, you know, and it's like, I didn't know this. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that it should be a problem to know numbers and 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 words at the same time. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I've uh, I'm, I was known, you know, in my previous scientific work for being a good writer. Uh, and when I began to write the novel, I had a coach. I've had several wonderful writing coaches in order to get that way. And and in the beginning, this this first woman said, "Jana, you have to learn to write sentences that are less than seventy words long." <laughs> But okay, I get that. <laughs> it sounds like you you learned how to do it. I did. I think so. All right. So you mentioned the novel. Tell us about Hannah's Ascent. Tell us the the primary story of the novel. Sure. So you know, I gave you a one sentence. There's a jacket blurb, but that's a little longer, and anybody could read that. But. Uh, it turns out that uh, the movie industry has something called a log line that you make up when you're pitching movies or, or screenplays and so on. So I wrote, and there's a certain formula for it. It's like, what's the main character? What do they, who's the main character? What do they want? What's in their way and how do they overcome it? And you've got to do all that in 30 words. So, so in, in Hannah's Ascent is a tenacious transgender girl from 1950s rural Colorado suffers amnesia and loss of language after a vicious assault setting her on a journey to fight her enemy, enemies, overcome trauma, and reclaim her true self. Mm. Um, so that's the log line. Uh, there is also a sentence. It turns out that uh, when you're, people will tell you, uh, at least some, that your novel should have one sentence somewhere that actually kind of encompasses the main point of the novel. And that appears very near the end of uh of this book, although I wrote it very near the beginning. Uh, and finally, she understood William Staunton's vicious attack merely condensed into a few hours what a hostile society can do in a lifetime of dehumanizing denigration. Mm -hmm. And so the juxtaposition of the, uh, of the physical uh, trauma and the emotional trauma, the physical violence, the, the psychological violence uh, that comes more subtly, but, but, perhaps even really more powerfully. Mm. Uh, is, there, is there any part of Hannah's story that reflects your own story? Uh, all of it and none of it. I mean, you know, everything's changed. Every, it's not, you know, it is a work of fiction. Uh, but as the, uh, as the jacket blurb says, uh, it's, it is the autobiography that might have been if I had done something a little differently, you know, in my youth had taken a different decision in my youth than I did. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that, yeah, I would, I could, I could say, uh, so, so there's like one, one brief passage, which uh, if it's okay, I would read it because it kind of gives a, a sense of, uh, of the style, I think, and, and of a little more depth to that story. Sure. Go ahead. The maelstrom of hot and cold emotions were a geothermal spring and a glacier fed mountain stream. Currents of icy determination mixed with bubbling passion, carrying occasional bursts of some repressed fiery force deep underneath. Staunton could take her dream job from her, but he could not take her self-respect. The next bit is Anna talking to her husband. I want to tell my story in my words, on my terms, without fear. This symposium is your day, but you could give an introduction about me. 
Tell them that more than half of us are assaulted during our lifetimes, that 14 were murdered in the U.S. last year. And here I am, not giving up. I want the story of the violence that was done to me to be a triumph, and I want to support other transsexual women. I want to say we don't have to be ashamed and to do it in the place where it all began, which was Boulder, Colorado, which is where I went to high school. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a story that is much more, it's a, certainly it's a story about overcoming trauma. And I know some readers have seen it as sort of an inspirational story and it's intended to be that, but it is also much more than that because it is a plunge into not only what it means to be transgender, but what it means to be human. Mm. I think every, every one of us has some sort of assault on, on our, on ourselves. I think at some point and it, and, and we, and it, as a young person, as, as a young child, you're defenseless and you put up defense mechanisms against it, which then can take years to uh, to dismantle and, and, and find that true self again. Um, every major, major part of the of the construction of the story has a face value and also a metaphorical resonance. So star scars can be on your skin, they can be inside language. She had, grows up, uh, you know, as it says, she only, she winds up, uh, coming out of this coma, speaking only German, which is the language she'd been studying and speaking with her adoptive parents, but it's not her native language. And yet that's the only one she's left with. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a play of, of language, culture, uh, uh, the, the sense of, of identity in, in all of those respects uh, that I think is far more general than, than just the story. It's a powerful story. On, on both ends, the face value and the metaphorical message. Right. It's a very powerful story, and um, I'm glad you shared it. All right, so now let's, the, when you talked about your career journey, you were going along as a scientist, and then at one point, there was a, a, a pivot, a turn into your own entrepreneurial. Uh, was there a defining moment that helped make that shift, or what was happening to help you move in that direction? Yes, yeah, so, so go, going from you know being a you know nominally contented employee of a big company with lots of people around and so on to being the entrepreneur, uh, in part came about because of the company. I mean, there was this was at the time that that HP Hewlett Packard was undergoing this uh, a big upheaval, and uh, they had just bought uh, another company and they brought in a new CEO who had never been a part of HP before. That's the first time that it ever happened. There's all these cultural changes in the company. And, uh, and and then there were layoffs and they offered me a VSI package and I said, hey, you know, I'll take it. Uh, you know, it was it was like an opportunity to do something new. And so I just grabbed it. I said, OK, you know, yeah, it, it's time. It's time to step out. And I didn't really know what I was going to do. I knew that I did not know anything about being an entrepreneur. Uh, and uh, and I would find out. Uh, and, and so that was really how that happened. Yeah. And I'm imagining. Uh, because this podcast we focus on, you know, as the title suggests, leadership purpose, but people who are looking for more meaning and purpose in their work, or it could be life, but we particularly here focus on work. And to see someone who kind of took a leap might be encouraging to someone else who's thinking about taking a leap. And so um, it's good to hear your story. And so when you took the leap, how was the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship? What what were the challenges in between and how did you overcome them? So, you know, clearly uh, the biggest uh, change is that, you know, you don't have this this big building that you go to, you know, in the workplace uh, and, and with lots of people around and friends that you meet down the, down the aisle, you have to make that up yourself. You have to cr create your own, uh, your own culture uh, around you or, you know, define your network. Uh, and, and that's something that I think people in a big company uh, often don't do like the network is within the company and now you have to go outside much more and you have to be much more proactive about it. Uh, that, um, so th that's kind of the personal part of it. I mean, obviously there are financial parts, you know, you have to, you know, figure out how to make money in a different way because a paycheck isn't just going to be sent to you every two weeks. And were you writing during those years 
writing, in this case, novels and or preparing for a novel, when did the writing come into your journey? Yeah, I, I mean, that, that was that was much later. That was just about, as I say, six, six years ago, um, seven years ago now, I guess. Um, and um, yeah, in, in, in your uh, preparation, you said, like, you know, how, how did I get start? Uh, what? Um, um, uh, what was the uh, the way that I got started on on that novel? And the answer is that when my son was was young, and you know, you read bedtime stories to your children, to, you know, and at one point he wanted me to tell him stories about myself, uh, and I said, "Oh, that would be very dull. I can't do that." So he said, "We'll make one up." And I thought, "This is going to be a total disaster. I have no idea how to do this." Uh, but he insisted, so I tried, and and he loved it. And, and, and he really seemed to genuinely, you know, I wanted more, you know, and this went on for, you know, a year or so I thought before that part of his, his age of life, you know, kind of went on and he was doing his own thing. So fast forward a few years, my partner had passed away and uh, it was just my son and, and myself and I needed something to turn that workday internal chatter off and get to sleep. And so I started telling myself a bedtime story. Um, and it worked really well. I could go to sleep in minutes, but then the next night I'd forget what I had uh, said, you know, the night before, you know, people's names, ages, and so on. So I decided I'll just make a few notes and that way I'll remember. So the next night, uh, by the next night, the next evening, I started making the notes. Uh, by the end of the night, I had a 40 page draft and it was kind of uh, all downhill from there. <laughs> I love that. I mean, creativity and inspiration can come from so many different places. And I love that it came from your heart sharing with your son, but also then it was uh, helping to, in a way, heal and nurture you. And then it turns into this piece of work that is now going on to inspire and give hope and heal others. That's amazing. Absolutely it, amazing. It it really just it it came it it came like that and it was all and it was all kind of there. I mean, I had to learn, you know, a lot about technique and how to, you know, make transitions from one paragraph to the another and how to organize scenes and so on. But uh but yeah, what what was the story? You know, when people say that it just comes from you, I mean it does, you know. Just... <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. All right. So well just mention you you mentioned earlier, you're in the process of an upcoming book. Tell us the title again of the book and then the premise of the book as you know it so far, because I don't know how far along you are in the process. Right. So so there's so there are two projects uh, and, and, and one. So I'll talk about the nonfiction one first, which is, uh, I mean, I, I, I um, as a part of as a part of learn of, of writing that first novel, uh, I, I wrote I didn't one thing I did not understand at all before when I started with genre and how to focus on a particular genre because otherwise your readers will be confused and and they kind of um, you know you can't have a big sprawling book uh, these days. I mean you need to have uh, you know there's certain word count you know that you. you know, it's, you know, if you're a journalist, like you have 1600 words in your paper, you know, each, uh, you know, day, well, you, so you get 90 or 100,000 words for a novel, but, but if you go over that, then, you know, people, agents and publishers will say, no, you've got to trim it. So there was a whole section of that novel that was just in a different genre, and, a, and it was a different story, and a real, and it's a minor character in Hannah's story, but it would become her her story in the new one um and um so i'm totally you know awesomely would just love to start that immediately but but then you know this whole issue of of uh transgender girls and women in athletics and and it become had become sort of a big thing in the news and and i felt like i knew certain things that were not being said uh and then i knew uh, and then i could easily like I, I get into research, you know, like in, in um, what's the name, the magic school bus. I don't know if you know that program, you know, according to my research, yeah, I love it. <laughs> uh, there are lots of academics who have done, you know, one, they've written wonderful papers on, you know, the sociology of this stuff, you know, and, and, and so on and the legal issues, but they're just, they're in arcane journals, you know, nobody, nobody's reading these things. So I thought, okay, 
there's something that I could do there because going back to that coverage of different areas from the scientific to the social and the psychological and so on. Uh, so that's what I started to do. So yeah, I, I gave it the, the what I hope was a clever title, Genes, Gonads, and Synopses, which is a shameless borrowing from Jared Diamond's wonderful book about uh, guns, germs, and steel. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, it turns out there's some just, I've learned a lot. So I thought it was all just going to be, oh, it's just, you know, the, the amount of testosterone. Well, it, yes and no. It turns out that's a very complicated story. And uh and it's also the achievements of women competing against men in the days before men had decided, no, you can't do that. It's something that I did not know the history of uh, very well when I started this. So I learned that there was a 17-year-old girl who struck out Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig in 1931. Oh, really? And, and then the commissioner of baseball immediately said, no, you can't be a part of this. <laughs> you know, they terminated her contract from this minor league team. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. I never heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. That sounds like a continuation of this um, important work that you've done through the novel. And now this is a, a different genre to carry forth the as important message. So good for right. you for doing that. Now, I mentioned before the podcast is Leadership Purpose. Do you think it's important for you or others to have a sense of purpose in your work? And if so, so why? And if not, why not? So, so the purpose part is, um, yeah, I, I wrote some some notes about it, and uh, I mean, honestly, I thought, you know, maybe I'm just sort of obsessed by purpose. I mean, you know, I should probably lighten up a little bit <laughs> uh, because everything in my life has always been uh, with a sense of purpose, and not in the sense of a an achievement in a in a hierarchy uh and and i don't mean by anything anything i say here is not to put anyone down who's done that first of all i think if you're going to become vice president of something you know by the age of 36 and like you have to have that kind of dedication that never occurred to me i mean i did it just honestly didn't occur to me and i thought uh the uh uh I mean, my life has been much more just driven by um, by following. It's like a cliche to say following my heart, but but it but that's what it is. It's like again, not having a lot of preconceptions from the beginning. I, I just sort of like, you know, I'm going in the direction that my body kind of wants to go, um, and whether it was in science. Uh, you know, the scientific research was something that I enjoyed doing. It was fun. It was rewarding. It was, you know, it's kind of like if you're, if you're a wolf, you like to run, you know, and, uh, <laughs> um, and that's, and that's the way it feels. But I also would not have, I did not want to be involved in anything doing military research. So, you know, whatever I do, it doesn't have to be inventing something that's going to be used tomorrow. It can have basic science in it. It could hopefully it's going to go into some technology, but it should be useful. It should be valuable to people and it should be positive and, 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 um, you know, contributing to, to our well being. Uh, I've al I always felt that. And that's what really led me, you know, out away from the lab bench and into this, uh, this e-inclusion thing, uh, and in the case of the creative writing, it's, it's the same thing. So I have, uh, I mean, you know, Hannah's Ascent is obviously, you know, centered on, you know, the, the gender identity issues and, and the discrimination uh, of that sort. But um, the the other one, the, the next one, I actually have a title for that too. It's called Three Shades of Edelweiss. And this is unfortunately, so people, uh, English speakers know the flower Edelweiss if they've seen, especially if they've seen, uh, what is it, uh, the the uh, the song I just quoted from, Julie Andrews, The Sound of Music. Uh, and, uh, but that, that word in German means noble white. And so if you put three shades in front of it, that should give you a hint as to the fact that there's going to be some, some uh, subtleties in this. And um, the, the ultimate, uh, that ultimate sentence uh, for this novel, even though I haven't begun to write it, I know what the sentence is, 
She accepted a responsibility which she did not have and asked for forgiveness which she did not need. And then she kneeled for herself, for her ancestors, and for all of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that sentence is a slight paraphrase of how a German magazine described uh, Chancellor Willy Brandt's uh, kneeling in front of the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial in 1971. And it's taking the same concept. He did that in respect to what the country, uh, his country had done in, in World War II. And I'm going to do that uh, for an American uh, who is doing something that our country, I think, has yet to do. Um, and so that's uh, that's where it's going. So there's a lot to be done there yet. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a, another powerful story. And by the way, you mentioned the titles earlier. And yes, I believe they are very clever titles. <laughs> Thank you. Very clever titles. Thank you. All right. So now the listener of the podcast is what I call a high achieving woman, a woman responsible, who's responsible, goal oriented, ambitious, good at a couple of things, supportive to other people around her, but not always receiving support, um, wanting more meaning and purpose in her life and work. Now, given that description, what's some word of advice or a tip or tool from either your personal life or your professional life would you share with the woman I just described? So this is, you know, uh, a, a very difficult question for me. And yet I thought, as I thought about it, I thought, okay, maybe I do have something to say here. Because on the one hand, first of all, I can say that that I, you know, came out to the world when I was 60 years old. So in some sense, uh, I I did not, you know, have the opportunity to do what uh, what is certainly at least a little bit easier for transgender women to do today. Uh, again, the ease is a relative term, but uh, you know, as as I said in the introduction to the novel, I mean, it was basically in in the nineteen fifties and the nineteen sixties, you had three chances, three opportunities. Uh, you could be in stealth mode and nobody knew. You could be an entertainer because in the entertainment world, uh, some eccentricity is, is uh, tolerated, or you could work the streets. And this is not just my opinion, uh, a very famous uh, transgender woman named Lynn Conway, who is professor of, now Professor Emerita of Electrical Engineering at uh, University of Michigan co-wrote the textbook, which has been the standard textbook of integrated circuit design for decades, uh, encountered this. And she said exactly the same thing when she transitioned at the end of um, the 60s. Uh, the, the CEO of IBM said absolutely. She had actually done an, some stellar uh, work on uh, on computer architecture that formed the basis for the IBM, the old IBM 360 computer. And he says, no way are we gonna have such a person in our company. And so she went away and just disappeared professionally and came back with something entirely new. I didn't do that, uh, but I had exactly the same feelings and the same knowledge. And, and I was just, uh, I was too fearful to imagine doing that. Uh, so, um, but you know, so when you 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 don't just when people use the word transition, I don't like it because it implies that you have changed uh, gender, and you don't. I don't believe that you do. Uh, you are that gender from birth, and you have to find it out, and you have to get over the social opprobrium that that has sealed it off from you. Um, so anyway, the my my thought about you know the the advice. I, I have, in these years that I've had, which have been wonderful years to uh, network with women in the Bay Area, uh, it, it's been just the most rewarding and wonderful experience. And I never experienced this before. Um, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's a sense of welcoming and, and you talked about supporting and, and, and these people do that. Uh, and they are all, for the most part, uh, professional women, just like what you've described. And I don't really fit in because I'm past that part of, of my life. Uh, 
and I'm, I'm into this other part. But, you know, the thing is that I've realized that cultivating the heart and and figuring out how to bring that to work without, you know, being, you know, having it on your sleeve without, without, you know, I mean, you're in a boardroom, let's say, and you got hard decisions to make and you're going to make them, you know, and, 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 you know, emotions, you know, were, are put into the, to the, uh, uh, into the back room for the moment, but you're still the same person. And I think that's what, that's what we, we have to be able to integrate and, uh, um, yeah, put put together. Um, so I, when I was thinking about what kind of advice, I thought, okay, you know, like I'm I'm thinking these people who who are on this track to some high achievement are uh, you know have had these goals, and and I'm just thinking I resonate with the sentiment in the song by Natalie Maines of the Chicks. She says, "I met the queen of whatever, drank with the Irish, and spoke with the hippies, moved with the Shakers, wouldn't kiss all the asses that they told me to." And, uh, you know, it's like, I just did it, you know, and I thought, okay, and yeah, I mean, she's successful. Uh, but uh, but what is it? It's following that beacon inside you uh, that I think in, in the end, that that is the key thing. So you can find a million books these days about, you know, the techniques of how to do negotiations and how to get more salary and, you know, and how to stand up to that noxious boss. But it's that you it, you should never forget to just follow that beacon. I love that. Follow that beacon inside of you. And to me, that's the definition of purpose. You know, a lot of people think that um, they have the viewpoint that your purpose is this grandiose thing out there. Um, find the cure for cancer, for example. Uh, solve the problem of homelessness. I think purpose is when you do what my understanding of what you're saying is when you connect with who you are inside and then you express it, you can express it on your job or in other areas and it could change over time. It's not just one thing at one time. So that's what I believe purpose is. So of course I'm um, delighting in hearing you say that. <laughs> That's right. that wonderful. That's exactly it. And, you know, like in, in this in this e-inclusion thing at HP, you know, we had a, a an expression called doing well by doing good. And, you know, and, and I'm thinking it's exactly the same thing in the in, in the human individual side. You you will do well if you do right by yourself, you know. Yes. Yes. I love that. <laughs> all right. I could talk to you all day, but I know you don't have all day. But is there anything I didn't ask that you want to share before we tell people how they can be in touch with you or if you have any last thoughts or, oh, I just want to say one last thing. If not, it's okay. But if you have anything, you're welcome to share it. Right. Uh, so the only, uh, so, so I thought there were there were two things. And uh, one of them is that I, I hope that uh, people will um, read uh, this novel as as literature and not only as an uplifting story. It's, it is an uplifting story, to be sure. That's what it, it was intended. It's had a positive ending. Excuse me, it has some very dark parts, which I believe accurately reflect real life, but they, uh, they contrast with hope and beauty. But I put a lot of effort into writing in, in what I, you know, Call for better, for lack of a better word, lyrical style, uh, which was a little bit illustrated in that that one passage. I thought about the this mountain brook, you know, which is actually very real. So, so on the east side of Sierra, as you can find exactly that. Uh, but it's so it's a very realistic scene, and yet it has all these symbolic and metaphorical resonances, which are poetic. I'm not a poet. I don't think I could write poetry, but in that sense, like. Uh, Boris Pasternak and Dr. Shivago. It's very poetic, even though it's not poetry. And I, I, I think this is worthwhile because I think that writing of that sort can stimulate people into seeing things from a different perspective. And that's why I think the novel is really valuable as compared to another nonfiction book. You know, saying why you know I'm transgender. What about this or that? It, you you can say things. When you do, you're, you're necessarily more vague and 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 uh, working with illusions uh, in in fiction, 
but this stimulates so much more in the mind that you wouldn't get if you're following that linear you know logical track so i hope that people can see that um and then i uh, you know on the you know on on the, the issues of a gender identity I, I don't know what i can add there i mean you know the word just the country is so crazy and and it's in so many ways but but i i hope I mean, the people who are listening to your podcast are going to be, you know, wonderful people looking for for insights into being, and how do how do we treat each other better? And uh, and I'm sure that that they will. So, okay, all right, all right. Well, thank you, thank you. I mean, you have such a, a rich, um, powerful history and story. So, thank you for sharing your time and wisdom with here with us here today. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, I, I, I just once again thank you for the opportunity. I mean, I think this is just fantastic, and and I'm I'm totally uh, in awe of uh, of being able to be a part of it. Oh, that's wonderful! All right, and so do you have a website or something where people could be in touch with you? It's just you know, it's very simple. It's janasheets dot com, uh, j a y n a s h e a t s. Uh, dot com and there is so there's a link to the book there there's also I do I do a blog it's not very often like it's not a weekly thing or anything remotely like that that's there's and but I'm probably going to try and make it a little more frequent uh, now but anyway I, I do talk about both the writing and and the political issues and so on uh, and there is uh, a contact form so you can easily then I will put I, I'm just about to set up an email list. I haven't done it yet. So I've got to figure out who to contract with, you know, like is it MailChimp? Is it somebody else? And so on. But uh, but I will do that. And But if anybody wants to just um, uh, um, put in uh, these, the uh, contact form, then I will definitely write back to them by email. Okay. And we'll be sure to put those, put your uh, website link in our show notes. Right. All right. Thank you, Jana. All right. So everyone, if you want to hear more from me or know more about the podcast, and I'd love to hear from you, love to hear your response to the episode and any questions or thoughts you might have, head on over to the podcast website, Leadership Purpose Podcast. <laughs> Easily enough, leadershippurposepodcast.com and send leave a message. Or if you'd rather go on social media, I mostly hang out at LinkedIn. So go over to LinkedIn at Robin L. Owens, PhD, at Robin L. Owens, PhD, although I'm on all the sites, but I spend most of my time on LinkedIn. All right, everyone, until next time, this is Dr. Robin. <laughs> <laughs>